That hit music even sounds outer spacey, doesn't it? You hear that? That whistling sound? Yeah. When Apollo 11 landed on the moon, the world rejoiced at another achievement of mankind. We were on our way to conquering space, it seemed. But just a few months before that, three astronauts on Apollo 10 got close to the moon on a scouting mission, only to hear strange noises and music far out in space. And it wasn't the only time this would happen. According to reports, the flight details were immediately classified by NASA, and only recently were the tapes released to the public. What was the Apollo 10's mission? What was the origin of the music in space? And why did NASA classify the mission details? Join us in this video as we look into how newly released Apollo 10 tapes reveal the existence of aliens. The Apollo 10 mission was the fourth crewed mission in NASA's Apollo program. Launched on May 18, 1969, it was designed to serve as a dress rehearsal for the Apollo 11 lunar landing. But no one realized that it would grow to become a legend almost bigger than the moon landing itself. NASA wanted a dry run of the procedures and systems required for a lunar landing without actually landing on the moon. The agency sent a crew of three astronauts, Thomas Stafford, John Young and Eugene Cernan, to carry out this task. The mission's primary objectives were to test the lunar module's performance in lunar orbit, practice descent and ascent procedures, and refine navigation techniques. Four days after the launch, the lunar module descended to within 50,000 feet of the lunar surface, providing valuable data on the challenges of navigating and landing on the Moon. However, the descent was intentionally cut short and the module underfueled to prevent an accidental landing. After completing their tasks, the lunar module docked with the command module and the crew returned to Earth. The success of the Apollo 10 mission was very important in the overall scheme of things as it helped gain confidence and validate the procedures for the subsequent Apollo 11 mission, which successfully landed astronauts Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin on the moon just two months later. So, what legend came out of the Apollo 10 mission? According to NASA's official reports, the Apollo 10 astronauts heard music and sounds coming from space as they orbited the moon. The reports and the audio recordings of the astronauts' conversations lit up Facebook and Twitter, as it was then called, with people claiming NASA was trying really hard to keep it away from the public. NASA confirmed the reports, and an audio recording of the event is available online. The ramifications of the confirmation and recording have made many people anxious. When the astronauts first heard the strange noises over their radios, they were beyond shocked. They were passing over the far side of the moon and were beyond the reach of any earthly signals. However, according to NASA, there is a perfectly rational explanation that has nothing to do with the presence of aliens or ancient astronauts. The strange sounds resulted from radio interference between the VHF systems aboard the Apollo 10 lunar module and the command module. But the Apollo 10 crew did not know that at the time, and they were clearly caught off guard. According to NASA's official transcript of the mission audio, the module pilot, Eugene Cernan, was heard commenting on the music and calling it outer spacey. He described it as a whistling sound. This comment has led many to claim that the music had alien origin. To add to the legend, an episode of the Science Channel series, NASA's Unexplained Files, recounts the conversation and includes the mission audio. The Huffington Post also reported that the transcripts of the Apollo 10 mission were classified and untouched in NASA's archives until 2008, producing an ongoing debate as to the nature and origin of the strange sounds heard by the astronauts. However, the NASA History Office denied the claim by saying that the mission audio was never classified and that a full transcript was published in 1973. The tapes were converted to digital format and posted online in 2012. In his book, Carrying the Fire, published in 1974, Apollo 11 command module pilot Michael Collins sought to provide a detailed explanation for the strange sounds. 
While he was orbiting the moon and waiting for Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin to catch up after blasting off from the lunar surface, Collins wrote, There is a strange noise in my headset now, an eerie woo-woo sound. According to Collins, if he had not been warned about it by the Apollo 10 astronauts, he would have been scared to his bones. He said, Stafford's Apollo 10 crew had first heard it during their practice rendezvous around the moon. Alone on the backside, they were more than a little surprised to hear a noise that John Young in the command module and Stafford in the lunar module each denied making. According to the radio technicians on the ground, the noise was caused by the interference between the lunar modules and the command module's VHF radios. However, this claim has been met with scorn, mockery and criticism from some sections of the public due to the belief that the noise and music were signs of alien presence on the moon. The alleged classified status of the incident and its transcription for almost four decades has caused many to believe that NASA was aware of aliens in the mission. And the fact that the incident happened when the astronauts were on the far side of the moon has further cemented that belief. The logic is simple. If the noises and music were caused by radio interference, why were the files classified and only made public 40 years after? Another important question is this. Why hasn't there been a mission to the far side of the moon since then? Did the crew come in contact with certain beings that scared them and NASA off? The far side has sort of gained notoriety in the UFO community for being the natural breeding ground for aliens. The fact that it is in total darkness for most of the year and is mostly turned away from Earth has fed such beliefs. When you look at the moon every month, what you see is its face, illuminated by the sun to varying degrees throughout its orbit around us. Thanks to its orbital dynamics, we only ever get to see that one hemisphere from Earth. The other hemisphere, referred to as the far side, is constantly hidden from us. This phenomenon is known as libration. Libration is a term used to describe the unbalanced positioning of the Moon, which is caused by the changes observed as it moves around the Earth in its orbit. This means we can only catch glimpses of the far side, but we can actually see about 59% of the Moon's surface from Earth at different times of the year. Until the first space missions to the Moon flew around our natural satellite, the far side of the Moon was regarded as a mystery. Many people think that the far side of the Moon is in total darkness due to its inclination away from the Sun, but it experiences day and night cycles just like the near side. When we see part of the Moon being illuminated by the Sun, giving it a half or crescent shape in the sky, the part of the Moon on the far side is being illuminated at the same time. When the Moon is new, the far side is in full daylight. When the Moon is full, it is nighttime on the far side. We only ever see one face because of a phenomenon known as tidal locking. Tidal locking is the phenomenon by which a body has the same rotational period as its orbital period around another celestial body. The Moon rotates on its axis roughly once every 27 days, which is the same amount of time it takes to orbit the Earth. It is rotating at a rate that means we always see the same face more or less as it moves around Earth. This means that the Moon is tidally locked to the Earth because it rotates at the same time as it takes to orbit the Earth. Tidal locking is a natural consequence of the gravitational distortions induced by one body on another. If both bodies are of comparable size and are close to each other, they can be tidally locked to each other, as is the case in the pluto charon system. As such, tidal forces from Earth have slowed the Moon's rotation to the point where the same side is always facing the Earth. The other face, most of which is never visible from the Earth, is therefore called the far side of the Moon. The first time scientists were able to see the far side was in December 1968. This was after the declaration by President Kennedy that the United States would place a man on the Moon and return him safely to Earth by the end of the 1960s. In 1968, NASA sent three people, Frank Borman, Jim Lovell and Bill Anders, on the Apollo 8 mission. They became the first humans in history to escape from low Earth orbit 
and see the elusive far side. When the Apollo 8 spacecraft flew around the far side of the moon, the signal to Earth was cut off for around 10 minutes. This loss of signal was extremely challenging for the flight crew and mission control. Apollo 8 was alone and truly cut off from Earth as it ventured where no human had ever gone before. When the astronauts came back from the far side, many of the flight team at Mission Control in Houston breathed a collective sigh of relief. But the problem? No one could say exactly why the break in communication happened. Fast forward to Apollo 10, and we have NASA documentation explaining strange events that happened during the mission. These events were in the form of some very odd sounds, as mentioned earlier. The astronauts described it as similar to the sounds made by an electronic instrument called a theremin, which was often used in creepy science fiction movies of the 1950s and 60s, as well as on the Beach Boys song, Good Vibrations. NASA claims that the far side was a no-go area due to radio disturbance and interference. But many people have doubted that, especially given Ingo Swan's experience with the CIA. By 1975, Ingo Swan had become a well-established figure in the remote viewing community. In case you don't know, remote viewing is a psychic ability to view and observe locations remotely like you are there physically. The United States government recruited Swan to remotely view Jupiter a couple of years before NASA sent a spacecraft to the planet. The success of that project eventually led to the CIA recruiting him to remote view the moon. In his second session with the CIA, Swan was given multiple lunar locations to view. At several of these locations, there wasn't much to see except moonscapes. According to Swan, other locations proved confusing as he was drawing multiple sketches of things he could not wrap his mind around. He claimed to have found towers, machinery, lights of different colors, and strange-looking buildings. He also found bridges whose function he couldn't figure out. One of them just arched out and never landed anywhere. Swan also described a lot of domes of various sizes, round things, and things like small saucers with windows. These were stored next to crater sides, sometimes in caves, sometimes in what looked like airfield hangars. While he had problems estimating sizes, he said that some of the things were very large. Elsewhere, he found long tube-like things, machinery or tractor, like things going up and down hills, straight roads extending some miles, and obelisks that had no apparent function. There were also large platforms on domes, large cross-like structures. Also, holes were being dug into crater walls and floors in some kind of mining or earth-moving operations. He also saw nets over craters and houses where someone lived, but he couldn't see who, except in one case. In that lone case, Swan saw some kind of people busy at work on something he could not figure out. The place was dark. The air was filled with fine dust, and the only illumination was a sort of dark lime green fog or mist. What Swan described next is something he found deeply disturbing. While viewing the humanoid activity, he claimed that they became aware of his psychic penetration. They turned and looked at him as though they could feel some sort of dimensional disruption taking place. As he looked on, some of those people started talking excitedly and gesticulating. Two of them pointed in his direction. He immediately felt like running away and hiding which he guessed he psychically did since he lost sight of this particular image. He recalled reporting what he had seen to Axelrod, the CIA agent who recruited him. He wondered how they could have done that if they didn't have some kind of high psychic perception too. In response, Axelrod asked him to leave the place quickly. Axelrod's response was odd, causing Swan to suspect that the agent already knew the people were psychic. Swan voiced his suspicion and raised concerns about whether the alien beings would come after him and try to kill him for his psychic intrusions. At this point, Agent Axelrod admitted that the humanoid Swan observed had certain things and capabilities that they were trying to understand better. But he assured Swan that there was nothing to suggest he would become a target of these beings. 
Swan repeatedly asked Axelrod to elaborate and explain what was known about these beings and the operation, but the agent was tight-lipped and evasive. He would neither confirm nor deny. Given that Swan's encounter was less than a decade after the Apollo 10 crew's experience on the moon's far side, it was really insightful into whatever secrets NASA might have been keeping for decades until now. So, it was beyond surprising when NASA appointed a new Director of Unidentified Anomalous Phenomena, UAP, research in 2023. To the general public and members of the UFO community, it felt like NASA was finally admitting what they had known for the past decades. Given the recent increase in sightings of unidentified flying objects and news about how the moon landing was faked, NASA wanted a man to keep tabs on the events and separate lies from truth. As a result, they created a new role, Director of UAP Research. The man tapped to do the work is Mark McInerney a former Pentagon liaison for NASA, who, for the better part of 25 years, has been on the government science beat. He had previously served in multiple positions at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center, the National Hurricane Center, and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. It will be McInerney's job to study the sightings, advancing science if the flying objects are confirmed to be extraterrestrial, and protecting national security if they're of international military origin. He is expected to have a lot of work to deal with. Over the past 20 years, there have been more than 120 sightings of objects that often appear to be flying with no identified means of propulsion and maneuvering in quick and often stop and start ways that no conventional machines can manage. While civilian sightings might have been regarded as untrustworthy, Many of these sightings have been called in by witnesses most people think of as reliable, such as United States military pilots. Their reports have added immense credibility to the UFO community. The official interest in UAPs goes back a long way. In 2007, Congress established the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program Task Force to investigate the phenomena. The group reached only a few conclusions and was disbanded in 2012 due to lack of funding. But the reports of sightings did not stop coming in, and in June 2020, as part of a sprawling COVID-19 relief bill, then-President Donald Trump called on the Director of National Intelligence and the Secretary of Defense to have their staff collaborate on a study of their own. Their report landed just under a year later, and again, the findings were unsatisfying, at least for people looking for intelligent life off the planet there was no evidence that the flying objects in reported sightings were extraterrestrial in origin, but no proof that they weren't either. The idea that they were friendly objects, otherwise classified US military vehicles out for a beta test spin, was ruled out. Although, if they were indeed classified, it's unlikely that the chiefs of intelligence and defense would spill the beans. The analysis concluded that it was possible that the vehicles were either Russian or Chinese, as both countries are known to be experimenting with hypersonic technology, but that was little more than a guess. The unidentified objects thus remained just that, unidentified. So it fell to NASA to try and identify them. In October 2022, the space agency independently announced it was establishing its own UAP study team. It charged the group not with figuring out what the flying objects are, but rather with establishing some kind of research and reporting program going forward. Three months later, the names of the team's 16 members were announced, including retired astronaut Scott Kelly, who in 2015 and 2016 spent nearly a year aboard the International Space Station. Other members are Anna Maria Berea, a research affiliate with the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence Institute, SETI, in Mountain View, California, and David Grinspoon, a senior scientist at the Planetary Science Institute in Tucson, Arizona. While NASA might find it hard to say, hey, we've always known about aliens, at least for the past six decades, the documents released and actions undertaken in the past clearly show that there is something unusual out there in space and amongst us.
thanks for watching another episode of Voyager. While you're still here, make sure to click.